Hello, we are here for the final episode of the MLS So Rare preview to end them all. Guys, the tournaments are back open, we're getting cards deployed, we're getting action back on MLS style. It's been an amazing series, I hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget to give all the guests a follow, all their links are down below in the description. I really hope you enjoy this guys, it's been amazing making this content and bringing it to you, I hope you've enjoyed it. I wish you all the best for the game week that's about to be upon us. Um, like, subscribe, share, retweet, guys. All that good stuff. And let's get stuck into it. <laughs> and, and then the last team me and Richard come on to we're going to be chatting about is Sporting Kansas City. Now, again, just to give the people at home a wee bit of a flavour of a background or whatever, Kansas, again, are one of these more bigger institutional clubs in MLS, you know, if you've been around here a bit longer, you might recognise them as um, Kansas City Wizards, you know, they've been around since MLS was born, you know, um, but in more recent times, SKC, Sporting Kansas City, last year they won the Western Conference, they finished top of the pile, which was a lovely achievement for them, didn't quite translate it in the playoffs, unfortunately, but they've got a really strong roster, and again, just before we were kind of coming in to, to chat about this, I was kind of saying to you, Richard, like, I, I quite fancy Kansas. I've got a few of their cards, and I'm quite optimistic for the season ahead. Um, Peter Vermees in charge again, MLS veteran, really strong coach, and there's not been too much upheaval in the squad. They've made some additions at the back with um, East Matt Mirren coming in, who some guys might remember from his time at Monaco, and I think he's played somebody else in France. Um, but you know the incomings have been kind of defensive, and yeah. They've brought, oh, he's just came in from Besiktas, that's the last club. And they've brought a guy in, an American guy from Hamburg, Travian Souza, which I don't know anything about. But I've heard him. <laughs> yeah, some solid acquisitions. Um, Kansas, I'd expect him to have a really big year this season, but would you would you go along with that as well, Richard? Yeah, if you asked me, I would totally... Like, I'm looking at the squad, like, this is a solid group of players. Like, they have so much depth in, you know, central midfield, the forward areas... You know, gets a little thin at center back, so I'm actually curious to hear like what you think about uh, Mirin or what's his name, Isimat Mirin yeah. from Monaco. Oh, I'm happy just to call him Mirin for easiness. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I I I recognize him when they signed him because he is like I say he was at Monaco for a while, and I think I only know he was at yeah. Monaco because of like FIFA or something like that. And I can see they've also mm. just got him from Besiktas, so he'll be you know he'll be one of these guys like John Mensah was amazing last year, and if anyone knows John Mensah, he was crap in England. You know, like, he was not good. You know, he didn't really make much of a career for himself in Europe. And he was being talked about for MVP last year at certain points of the season, you know. So, yeah. Mirren, I don't think it's beyond his capabilities to be John Mensah-esque, you know. And that's ideal. Like, looking at, the, like, the Las Vegas odds, like, they're middle of the pack. They're behind Portland, but kind of, like, puts them at, like, number 10 overall. But if... I think a lot of it hinges on... So they used to have, like, historically MLS, like, Kansas City defense. Like, if you're playing fantasy, that's what you want to target, right? Like, in the past, like, the Nick Beasler days, the Aurelian Cullen days, um, the Ike Opara days. Gee, what a legend. Um, Love Ike. So yeah, like, if... So they've kind of been missing that... I like Ike, too. <laughs> they've kind of been missing that center back um, in the past two years. Like, it really took a nosedive in terms of, like, the goals they can see, the shots given up, all those, like, defensive categories. So if, you know, Mirren comes in and I think he partners with Punchech, yep. maybe Fantas. Um, yeah, they get that defensive stability back. Yeah, Melia, Melia is going to be an absolute bargain at that point. Um, I've actually got their left back uh, big on Lewis Martins. Just because he's like so cheap. He basically like almost minimum price currently. And he missed some time with injury last year. Lost his spot to Dia. Then Dia was really bad in playoffs, but they gave up three goals consecutively. Got subbed out at halftime in their last playoff game. Uh, oh, really? Can't imagine that bodes well for him. No. <laughs> um, Definitely doesn't. Um, so, I, yeah. I picked up a few Kansas players. I like the sound of this Lewis uh, Martins. I actually haven't even clocked this guy before. This is a new one on mm -hmm. me. Um, but it seems okay. Especially if he's going to be playing and he's a fullback, so I can get behind that. So. Yeah. Kansas, whenever I watched I watched him a few times last year because of Johnny Russell. I've, that's one of the cards I've got. This guy's really cheap. Lewis Martins, if, yeah. he's, if he's going to be playing a 27-year-old European fullback, yeah. 0.046 is his cheapest one on the market at point of recording. He could be a wee bargain. 
<laughs> um, for sure. I've got kind of enough in defence at the moment for me personally. But yeah, um, I, I watched them a good bit and a lot of their success comes from wide play. We we're kind of chatting about this with one of the other teams, you know, but if you've got quality, pace and production in the wide spaces in MLS, you will you will create chances and if you have goal scorers and you will you you'll do very well. Um so I like the sound of that. In terms of like that kind of wide play, Johnny Russell was a big player for me last year. Did very, very well. And you know, if you look at his career over MLS, it's been very quiet but very impressive, you know. He's never really been in the shout for an MVP or a golden boot or anything, but you know, he turns up and he puts the work in, undoubtedly. Yeah. Who else do you have? You said you have a bunch of uh, Kansas City players, right? Yep, I've got a few. The other ones I yeah. also hold is Polito, Gaddy Kinda, and Sanchez Eli. So they're the four that I've got. Nice. nice. That's yeah. Polito is is my hopes and dreams <laughs> in terms of like SL five this year. Nope. Um, I think he's currently in Mexico, supposedly with the national team, but sitting out because of a knock. You know, not great. But uh, if, if that guy stays healthy, I mean, I think he's right up there with like the elite forwards in MLS. Um, his output, like, I think he only played 1,000 minutes last year, but it was, like, a goal or assist every game, essentially. It was something ridiculous like that. So, yeah, it's very hyped for that. His production was amazing last year. It, even on SO5, like, his scores were crazy. And, again, when I watch it, when I, watch, I don't know what you've seen of him yourself, I suspect more than most of the viewers at home, but whenever I watch Polito, I was really surprised at how clever a player he was. I thought he was going to be... A fat, a, a flat track yeah. in the box bully target man type guy, but he's really clever. He dropped in a little pockets, playing one two passes, playing Russell in on the overlap, playing Busio in. Play, you know, I uh, actually, honestly, I was really impressed by him. And as long as the guy stays fit, I think he's nailed on as being uh, an SO five demon. As long as he's fit, yep. that's the big asterisk over See, it. He, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. I mean, he's got the goal threat and like some of the creative, play, like you mentioned, which shows in his assist numbers, and then. Yeah, I don't know why Vegas is, uh, or like in general, like it's kind of a looking at the squad. Like this is this could be like an MLS Cup like contender, basically, right? Like, but I think there's a lot riding on some of the younger guys, right? Like, I think Lindsay probably more of a safer pick um, in terms of like the young guy at right back, um, Jalen Lindsay. Like, I think he's his card has skyrocketed in price, um, yeah. but also posts ridiculous scores. I don't know if you can pull it up what you can see like his averages are but it's like i'm just gonna pull him up on like, so we are. yeah it's like what like high 50s like basically a lot of a lot of green scores yeah um and he plays right behind russell so that's that's a, that's a good combination right to have there. Mm-hmm. I'm just looking at his background, so yeah, he's just, he's just he is a homegrown Kansas boy through and through, you know, Swope Park yep. Rangers and all their kind of little feeder yep. clubs and everything. So these are the types of guys along with Busio, and we've seen guys in the past, you know, there's some guys that are more well known to most of the guys that will be watching this video that move into Europe, you know, but the guys that do well at MLS, MLS clubs, in my opinion anyway, are the ones that come through like an actual constructed academy pathway process, you know, that, yeah. So when they get to the first team, like your Lindsay has and a few other guys we spoke about, they can hit the ground running. They know their role at defending set pieces. They know their role at attacking set pieces. They know what's expected of them on and off the ball. So it's no surprise that yeah. these guys with talent are able to shine. He's only 19 years of age on his card. He might be 20 now, but yeah, he's hovering around half a coin to a third of a coin. He's um, he's a pricey asset, to say the least. Um, I mean, and then Busio too. I think... Maybe that's why some people are like negative on Kansas because Busio, like I think they like ceremoniously gave him the number ten shirt, shirt. so yeah. he's like they're ten to go. Like it's his spot to lose. Like basically gave him to the keys to the car. Like come on, let's go. Um, if he hits, like this is a easy playoff team. But like there's like that uncertainty. Like if you know Busio doesn't fill those shoes, or if you know. Mirroring the new new fullback or new center back doesn't hit or like Walter doesn't yeah. That's the downside, but the thing that the thing that I struggle to get my head around with Busio is just I know he was given the number ten shirt like you said there, but where does he where does he play? I've seen him play yeah. ten, I've seen him play wide, you know. And when I have watched him, like he is very technically gifted, you know, he's a very good player, you know, undeniably. So we were talking before and you've kinda of mentioned it already, but they do have a lot of depth in midfield, you know. So if he is going to be playing 10, you know, how often yeah. will he play 10? Will he be starting? Will he be an impact sub? Will it be a gradual bleed out throughout the season? Maybe he's a sub at the beginning and towards the end he's starting. 
it's a hard one to call, especially if the price pandemic is at at the moment. If you're holding exactly. from last year, you're doing well, but if to pick them up the now, um, you'd expect them to play, because as you say, with the number 10 shirt getting given to him, you would expect that's a kind of hallmark of you will be a first teamer. But it's, it's quite hard to predict, isn't it? Yeah, because I mean, the, the price you're buying that today, that kind of implies he's going to be the surefire starter. But given that, you know, there's so many guys around him. Um, yeah, I don't know. I honestly, like, uh, I think in preseason he's been missing with the national team, so it's a little harder to call. Yeah. I'd be surprised if he doesn't feature at all. Um, oh, thinking, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be <laughs> not great. Um, I, I think they put him in as starter. Maybe impact, like, halftime sub early on. Especially, like, I think they're still missing. Walter hasn't even joined the team yet. Uh-huh. If, I, if memory serves me, like, there's some, uh, like, you know, COVID travel, like, if you're making a signing from overseas, that's going to have an impact. So perhaps that plays in his favor, and hopefully he hits the ground running. But, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty there for that price tag. I'd rather have Lindsay for what's worth. Yeah. Like, and, again, this is something we've not really touched on this video, but we kind of have without. But one thing to bear in mind for, for the people at home is, like, any international players that are in MLS, like, the MLS doesn't really shut down for international breaks. It just kind of lets the players yeah. go and it carries on without them, you know. So, um, yep. guys like Polito, if he's fit, he will be in the Mexican team. And the kind of the striker that will fill his shoes, it did last year anyway, is Kyrie Shelton. He's a striker at the moment that you can get quite cheap. So, if you think about how often Polito will be away for internationals, never mind any potential injuries he may, you know, you may even say he's likely to get, then that could be a wee sneaky one you could get in the back door for a rotation option. Um. So that, that kind of thing is always worth considering. We were talking before coming on camera as well about Tim, Tim, uh, Tim Melia. Yeah. Did really well last year in the playoffs, saving a bunch of penalties and all that kind of stuff. He's a wee bit of a legend in the league because he's, he's been there his whole career and been there, seen there, done it, and all that kind of thing. And again, if you're looking for a, a proper, solid goalkeeper that you know is going to play, is going to be at a top club, he would be one of those contenders that would go in with your Brad Guzans of the world and your Steve Clarks and you know whatever yeah. else. Undisputed number one. And you can you can almost guarantee a level of production or something like that. I would suggest. Yeah, with the penalty saves now, like I don't know if he like was like a prolific sh like penalty stopper before that, but saving three in a row, you know, that's another way to get to like up that decisive score. Not big Because like you don't need a clean sheet if you're saving a penalty. Like no, that's it, if man. you get both, that's a hundred. <laughs> because there's a lot of penalties in MLS. You know, like, there's a lot of penalties yeah. in football in general. Yeah, there. It's because. I remember when I was growing up, if there was a penalty, it was like, oh, wow, there's a penalty. You know, but now it's like, <laughs> oh, there wasn't a penalty, you know, <laughs> in that yeah. game, you know. So having a guy that's, cap that's confident and capable from 12 yards is definitely um, valuable to have. And I'll just try to think if there's anything else I would want to touch on from Kansas. I see, I really backed them to do well. That, that odds thing from yeah. um, Vegas that you were showing us doesn't see yeah. them doing well at all. I really don't get it. Even last year, uh, a lot of people seem to be surprised that they won the Western Conference. I wasn't really. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got, you know, they, they just attack. You know, they just go for it. Yeah. They just attack people. And um, if you're happy to do that and you've got a goalkeeper like Tim Melia who's acrobatic and happy to make saves, then you've got a chance, you know. Yeah. They're opening five fixtures, right? Do you want to hear this, Richard? Away to the yeah, Red Bulls, at home to Orlando, away to RSL, at home to Austin, oh. and then away to Dynamo. Oh, wow, so that's quite, that's quite attractive, hits. I would say. Yeah, wow. Orlando's tough. Wow. Red Bulls are a bit but of an unknown, but again, I'd be quite happy after with that, that. Yeah, smooth sailing. Wow, that's again Tim Melia. If you if you got him, like. And then see if see if you go past that, Richard. Right, so that's the opening five games, right? But see the next one, two, three. See the next three games after that. Is they've got the White Caps at home, they go away to San Jose, and then they've got Houston at home. So their first look. What? They play. Wow. Yeah, their first opening eight games is very appealing. Oh, yeah. Who knows? You what basically happened, hit. But <laughs> Once you make it past Orlando, you have all like Salt Lake, Houston twice. That's, you know, Vancouver in there. That's really, really good. If San, is it San Jose? No. Yeah. But still, like, that. Wow, that's really, really good. That might be like a target for me to buy after, you know, hopefully Orlando puts a couple past them. Yeah. <laughs> to break it down. But the price of it, yeah. That's perhaps. a great run. 
But then after that little run, it gets really tough. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you sell. You sell. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Then after that, it's Portland. It's you guys at the Rapids. Then it's mm. LAFC. Then it's the Galaxy. So they've got a really tough yeah. little conju- you know, little group of four fixtures there. Yeah. So. Canvas yeah. will be a one that I'll watch with interest. I'm sure you will as well, and probably many others, because there's a lot of you know. If you've got Busio, then you have to be a massive Kansas fan um, because of yep. <laughs> how closely tied you will be investment wise to them. But there's a lot of really good SO5 caliber players across that lineup, and they would definitely be a team I'd expect to get to the playoffs, undoubtedly. Mm-hmm. Agree. Okay. Yeah, I think like in terms of like taking like an outside shot at some of like even like you're betting on like some of those Vegas odds. Like this seems like. The perfect setup where you know if some of the two three pieces fit right in then the rocket is basically taking off towards mls cup like this is a great team i think yeah. okay i totally agree um the vlog i have just realized they've actually sold eric Hurtado to montreal i didn't realize that happened and i remember oh. seeing bezler left for austin i think bezler uh, i don't know we're not talking austin but we'll just finish on this point with him but bezler i've you know Ike Opara is obviously really famous yeah. you know for being good and whatever but I put, in my mind anyway, and this is me watching MLS from afar, right? But yep. I put Eichel Parra as probably the best renowned centre-back. But I think Bezler mm-hmm. and Hedges are, like, definitely the category below, you know, those types of guys, you know? Yep. So, that was um, a great pairing. Yeah, so but hopefully hopefully the boy uh, Eastmat Mirren comes in and he's got some shoes to fill, but let's hope he's capable. Yeah. And they got, what, Fontas is another one that I think I've seen on Twitter where it's like, Look at these scores because every time he plays, he posts like mid seventies. I think he like just gets I was incredible amount that, of like all that scores. See when I bought Eli, that's what I was like. I never really like, paid attention Eli, to, him. but I seen his scores and I was like, Jesus man, this yeah. guy plays all the time, and he's he's yeah, tiny. Up bonus. Yeah, and Gaddy Kinda as well. Like I managed to pick him oh, up yeah. really cheap because he was actually out the team for a bit. I don't know if I was down to COVID international restrictions, COVID, you know that kind of thing. But when he does play, oh yeah, your Fontas is really cheap. Yeah. Really, really looking cheap. Looking at Kinda right now. He's got a oh, bunch yeah. of DNPs and stuff. But if you look at when Kinda plays, similar to your man Fontas, yeah. you know, wow. <laughs> just good bang for buck, you know. Yeah. Um. So I think it's still like it's not said if it's pun- like Punchet, Punchet, whatever it should be ahead of him, but uh who knows that's the croatian guy isn't it Punchek, yeah mm-hmm. Punchek. yeah i think he has a card has he got a card again i don't recognize this name i don't think so my problem Punchek. can be sometimes richard is I'll, I'll get my targets and i'll just laser beam on them you know so yeah. I, I, it's part of the reason i really love the community because like i will just focus in on the guys i've identified for me and i'll miss some stuff you know it's just pure blatant yeah. oh how have you not seen this guy and i'm like oh shit, nah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you know, never heard of this guy before. It's just because I'm just like single minded, like this is the Same. guy I'm buying. But that's Punchic, yeah, he gets 90 minutes quite a lot. Is he, did you say he's got a card? No? Uh, he doesn't, he doesn't. He doesn't, so he'll be one that we'll all be clambering for then, no doubt. Yeah. Um, in the yeah. 2021 issues. <laughs> yeah, no cards. Scores don't look great. But... So perhaps the other centre back is the one to own. Yeah, but th- that's the thing as well, is like, even though the scores aren't great, you know. There'll be a lot of people that will see that as a good entry point. You know, it's a wee bit of a gamble, you know, but you'd expect okay. him to be part of a strong team. If he is a starting centre-back along with Mirren, then that could be an increase in previous performance as well as, you know, everything else, you know. So he could be one to keep an eye out on for sure. And again, this might sound a bit snobby or whatever, but when you see European players in MLS, I think, especially from a yeah. surreal perspective, you've got a wee bit more confidence of thinking this guy's form could pick up, you know, because you kind of trust the fact... Maybe the academy they've came from, or their previous pedigree, yep. or whatever. I'm looking at uh, Puncic the now. He's played over 150 games at a quick glance in Bundesliga two, which is a decent level. Um, he played a lot for Rijka, and now I can tell you, the team he played for here, Rijka. See when he was playing for them, I can tell you before, without even looking into this, they did really well in the Europa League for a few seasons. So he'll have, he'll have some European background in him. I can promise you that, and. Um, Maccabi Tel Aviv, 11 games, doesn't really say much about anything, to be honest. Um, but yeah, so yeah. something like that, I could get behind him if he was cheap enough, for sure. And if you're a new manager looking to get your first couple of defenders, if you can catch this guy under the radar, it might be hard after this video goes out, but if you're able to, <laughs> then um, yeah. he could be a great little I mean, starter. Yeah, like, I think, uh, like, 
for such a good team that we just talked about, the fact that some of the defenders are just going so cheap, Melia maybe even too. Like, that's this is like Dia or not Dia. Um, the fact that Martin's like I think I've tweeted about him a couple of times, and the fans have always been like, you know, there's two copies for point oh five, and they're gone immediately. It's like this guy lasted less than a minute after you tweeted, and it's like you know that's fine, but yeah. Turns out we look. You looked just a uh, couple minutes ago, right? There's another copy. Like it takes a while for like things to really catch on, and the fact that he's still out there, like you know, he's got to keep refreshing. I kind of think the same about Shelton something. because, like, when Shelton was playing, like, I, I really like Kyrie Shelton. I don't know if you'll you'll know this or yeah. remember this, right? But when NYC came out as expansion, oh, yeah. Ky- Kyrie yeah. Shelton was one of the big draft picks out of college or yeah. whatever, and there was they, they had a lot of hype around him. He's not really quite made it. He's a solid MLS guy at this point. Oh, his price has went up, actually. He's about 0.2. Yeah. I think people are expecting Toledo to be injured. <laughs> yeah. What do you know? Yeah. But, um, but he's, a good, he's a good, capable striker. I, I don't know. I would, uh, somebody like him, you could easily get him a bit cheaper when um, Toledo is playing because he's not good. He's yeah. not going to start if Toledo's fit. Shelton, I don't see it. But, um, he could he could be in left wing, but yeah, yeah that's not be. like same spot. I, you know, it, but, but I was never convinced with Shelton at New York when he played wide. I liked him a lot when he played through the middle, but yeah. at that time they had David Villa, He's, you know, so you're never going to play through the middle ahead of him. <laughs> you know, so, um, now you're Polito. <laughs> yeah, same tier, right? <laughs> I so, but I remember Shelton coming through. It was like him on the left, Jack Harrison on the right, and then Polito through the middle, and they looked really good. But he never really got the goals, and obviously he's moved on since and all the rest of it, but. He is a capable player. He's very good. But I just don't see him starting ahead of Polito. So if this is somebody you're looking at, yeah. maybe wait till Polito gets a few starts. You'll see that price gets a wee haircut on it. And then when Polito goes away to Mexico or he gets injured, the inev- yeah. then you're in. <laughs> the inevitable knock. Yeah. Just knock. It's always in quotes too on Twitter. It's like, he doesn't have a knock. No, he has a knock. And it's like, <laughs> well, what are you saying? What, what? <laughs> what are we supposed to be reading between the lines on this one? Yeah, like, what? Yeah, it's just, uh, you know. Let's have a wee look at Eli before we plug it off here with Kansas. We've spent the longest time oh, talking yeah. about Kansas. I suspect that this might be the case because I'm quite a big proponent of Kansas at the moment. But, um, yeah. so I, like Eli, for example, I think when I looked at him, yeah, he's like Barcelona Academy. So I thought straight away, right, yep. well, Barcelona Academy, La Masia, if you're playing in MLS, you know how to pass a ball, you know how to tackle, you know, and... That's kind of half the battle. That's pretty good scores too. Yeah, his scores are like, solid. His price is actually still really decent. He's about 0. 0.1, give or take. And um, yeah. he'll play every game he's fit for. I, I like him a lot. Gary Keane is nice as well. Don't imagine. Yeah. Might pick up. Might pick up Keane. So, like I said, this is not my death chart. This is the. This was put out by a you know an MLS uh, professional, <laughs> somebody who you know yeah, works yeah. in the. In the, in the pundit industry so he just shared this and i don't actually think this is completely accurate at this point now i think things have changed a little bit if i had to guess we'll see just based on how their their last preseason game um has gone so far but yeah so to start off okay lafc so they were six in the western conference last year and kind of a tale of two cities i mean they were first in goals scored amazing offensive team obviously a lot of different i you know team with a lot a lot different different times they had kind of the pre Vela, you know, uh, period for about two thirds, three fourths of the season. Yeah. Then Vela comes in and, and, you know, they look a little different. You had the Rossi call up then COVID case. Just, I mean, you had the Atuesta injury COVID case. I mean, just, it was just one thing after another and they could never really get settled. I really think if they would have had another two or three weeks, I think they would have beat Seattle in that, in that first playoff game. They looked pretty good yeah. in, um, what was it? They played a team in Mexico in, um, was it the, oh, what tournament was it? I can't remember now. It's slipping my mind. They played. It been the last played, season's Champions League. I think that was quite late. In yeah. Because I remember yeah. they were playing in it in December. Yeah, and they were, they were like five minutes away from winning. It was so close uh, for moving on. But, you know, they're my team. They're closest to me geographically. I adopted them last year. And, um, you know, I'm all in on LAFC, you know, just emotionally invested. Uh, and Serrera invested. <laughs> I'm excited <laughs> to see what they do. You know, with the healthy, with the they could be healthy and they can keep the team together. I think this is going to be, you know, could be a good year. I could definitely see them top three in in the West. So, okay, let's talk about the the, the major personnel changes to start out. So, they added Baird. Um, so gone is Bradley Wright Phillips, and gone is Brian Rodriguez, who didn't have a card and played on the wing. 
and he was a really controversial kind of player for the LAFC community because just uh, he just had flashes of brilliance, but then he also just he had just so many boneheaded plays and passes. It was really frustrating. <laughs> Did not seem to be a very accurate shooter and took quite a few shots. So I'm actually kind of glad he's gone. Uh, you know, the transfer hasn't worked out, and or the loan hasn't worked out. We'll see what happens. But they brought in Baird, and I'm high on Baird. I, I went out, I bought two Baird cards, I traded one now, but I got great value for him. And I think he is, you know, not cheap anymore, obviously. But he could be the Bradley Wright Phillips of last year, but better, because he's, you know, 23 instead of 32 or whatever. Um, that's assuming he gets, he wins the spot and he keeps it. Um, like I said, I don't think that their, their, their formations are going to look just quite like this. But the other major addition was Kim Moon Wan on the right side. He is a he was on I think Ulsan. He was he's a, a Korean player. I think he was on Ulsan last year. I, I don't actually know. Um, <laughs> to be honest, I have to okay. really I have to, I have to look it up. Um, but you know he is brought in to you know shore back the shore the backfield up and you know, add depth. And there's kind of you can you know they have Mario back. He Mario was injured for most of last year. Um, if I remember correctly now. And so they, you know, they were really strong two years ago in defense. Obviously they had Zimmerman <laughs> and then they lost Zimmerman and they just completely lost their defensive, their defensive identity. They had no defensive identity. They were asleep. They allowed horrible goals. I mean, they were, they were, their goals allowed were 39. And honestly, I'm surprised it was only, they were only the the 19th, uh, the 19th worst. I thought they would have been even lower. Um, but, you know, Hopefully they can be a little more stronger in the center last, you know, with Segura and Rio, you know, another year, another year working together and, you know, we'll see how it pans out. Is Blackman going to play on the right? He's not really a true right back all the way. From what I understand, you know, just thinking last year, he was in that position quite a bit and he was at times out of, out of position, uncomfortable. You know, where is Blessing going to play? He played all over the field last year <laughs> and that really affects his sore rare value because at times he was a great card and then at times he was not so great. After the scoring change, he was less good, kind of like Nagby was. Yeah. Um, but, you know, obviously it all starts it all starts in the center and the top. Atuesta, Rossi, and Vela, these guys are the all-stars as far as sore rare goes and MLS goes and the ones who, you know, are, you know, potentially division, region, league winners, whatever you want to say. And yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what they can do this year while they have a chance to play to play with each other. How, what are you? What are your thoughts? I'm really excited about LA this year. Pretty much for, for the, everything you said. Um, I picked up a far fan. I know he's listed here as backup left back, but I'm crossing my fingers that he maybe does start ten plus games, maybe fifteen if I'm lucky. The midfield is the see the blessing I had. I, you know, I don't know if you know this story, so sorry if you do, right? But. I entered, listen to this, right? I entered America D2 one, um, one game week with five rares, would you believe, right? And yeah, I knew that, yeah. You know that story? I would say yes. you do, right? Because the people at home have heard it already. Anyway, I got a Latif Blessing super rare, and on the old scoring matrix, as you rightly said, he was incredible. He was playing right back, I think, at the time when his scores yeah. were optimal. Um, but I think that I think their midfield, you know, Chifuentes, K, and Atuesta, I think if you... If you were to get all three of them into your gallery, you're not going to be disappointed with the output they're going to give you in different ways. Obviously, everyone's eyes do go to the Rossi and the Vela. But one thing I've taught myself with, with So Rare is quite often it's the story, sometimes it's the story under the headline that you really need to think about when you're building your gallery. Rather than, you know, like it's, it's okay for me and you, like I've got a Vela, you've got a Vela to think, oh yeah, it's going to be great. Some people could maybe walking on the platform yesterday or today might not have that at our disposal. So, do you know what? Well, if Vela's going to score twenty five goals, and who's going to be the who's going to be making the assists for him? Maybe Corey Baird, maybe Mark Anthony Kay, maybe Jeff Fuentes, maybe Kim, maybe Pla You could be a fullback. You know these types of things. So if you're not able to get into the exact card you want, there will be other cards that enable you to still kind of benefit from the knowledge and the research you've done. So it's maybe sometimes scratching, uh, stra scratching beyond that because I think LA will be so good this year that any player that's in their team consistently will offer you something on SO5 because of the way they play. Yeah, I mean, it, you're exactly right. I think there's lots of different opportunities for high scorers. I, I don't think Atuesta can be underestimated as far as his value if he's if he stays healthy and yeah. stays on the team is with, with these types of you know people up front and the assist opportunities. Just looking at how he ended the season last year, 
I mean, his his not his game scores without decisive were were the highest of any MLS player by far. I mean, he ended 76, 83, 44, 88, 78, 36, 95, 85. He had three green scores in the last seven games or eight games, and three of those were with no decisive actions. I mean, he scored a he scored a 95 against Portland with no decisive without a decisive score. He had a 60 all around score. I mean, he's just you know insane amount of passing, creating chances. And, uh, you know, it really looked impressive at the end there when they're kind of starting to get, get it back together. I'm super excited for, for, you know, what he could potentially do. I got a super rare and rare all lined up. You know. um, so one thing to think about is last year, Bradley Wright Phillips and Rodriguez took um, 25% of their shots and they're gone. So now, granted, Vela was not in for a big portion of the season. and He's probably going to eat up quite a bit of that. Yep. But yeah, I mean, the question is who else is going to potentially get some of those lost shots and, you know, is, is Rossi going to have the same role? He Rossi kind of played all over the place, depending upon who was injured. Yep. And, you know, he did, but I think he did work. He did the least, I think he was the worst when he was playing up, up top, but hopefully he won't have to play the number nine. They brought him, they, they alternated him into various different positions depending upon game situation. But like I said, I, I'm hoping Barry gets the, gets the position and, and has a chance. I was not, I was oh, I was always meh on Mus, Mus, uh, Musovski. So they had a preseason game, and in that game, in the de- on defense, um, Kim did not start. He came off the bench. Blackman started over Kim, and that's how they lined up. The other big question for LAFC, big big question is goalkeeper. Uh, it's really it's it's no one knows. It's it's, it's a <laughs> yeah, it's a big battle between you know Sisniega and Vermeer. And Sisniega started the last preseason game, so I, I think it's going to be committee. I mean, I think it's going to be you know whoever has the hot hand and you know how they look. And it was hard. They scored, they had a, they had a lot of goals scored from from very far out and. That was, you know, quite a few goalkeeper errors last year. Both both goalkeepers had some hot spells and some really poor spells. And, you know, it's just, it, it was really poor play all around. But, but part of it was just the defense was, was just so poor. So cool. not sure who's going to win. You know, Vimir doesn't have a card. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's kind of an interesting yes. you know, thing right there as far as Serrero's concerned. Um, looking at the schedule, you know, Lots of potential international call-ups, of course. You know whether or not Rossi and Atuesta are going to stay after you know through the summer is a big question mark. Um, they also have an interesting opening game. They get to play Austin at home in Austin's inaugural uh, first game, which is Stop kind of exciting. Of fire. <laughs> For Austin, Stop yeah, <laughs> tough, t- tough, tough to start out uh, against LAFC in the you know in the bo- in, you know in LA in the in the bank, but. Okay. And then the two games in Seattle are definitely circled because, you know, they're just, whenever LAOC plays Seattle, it's just, it's a great rivalry. They want to get revenge for, I think Seattle knocked them out of the playoffs two years in a row now. Yep. And yeah, I think that I know that the, the LA fans are, are eager to, for those. So, yeah. Um, I can definitely get behind them on that. I think, see, but I actually, I've given this a lot of thought with other teams, but I've not actually given it any thought with LAFC until you raised it there. But since I'm looking at their starting eleven. I think you could probably say 10 of them are internationals. So, you know, there's a there's a really significant chunk of their team that are at risk of missing portions of the season with qualifications and cups and whatever else that's going on throughout the year. So that's definitely something to think about. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really quite annoying. I mean, Rossi left two different periods last fall and didn't really play at all, barely, barely played. And, yeah, it's just... It, it's so frustrating for MLS fans, but you know, what are you going to do? Um, as far as potential interesting prospects, they have the 17, I think he's 17 Torres, Christian Torres. I mean, he's definitely hopefully a player for the future, you know, yeah. a lot of talent, you know, super raw, got into a couple of games last year. So he has scored, scored his first goal, you know, looked like somebody who could potentially be, you know, interesting in a couple of years or if thrown into a more prominent role because of personnel changes. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, it's very exciting as far as, you know, LAFC's Duke is also a potential, you know, interesting, interesting 
long-term prospect. Didn't play much at all last year, but. I think when the new cards came out, the main one I'm going to be chasing down is probably a Chifuentes. I don't know how much of the background you know about this guy, but he was like linked with like Celtic, the team I support, and I think he may have been linked with somebody like Man City. He was linked with a big kind of English team, maybe not for starting, but to get loaned out and all the rest of it. And he couldn't get the work permits. And then LAFC ended up showing up, or the MLS showed up. And it, it, it was quite a big price tag. I can't remember exactly, but I think they paid like £3 million for him, which is quite a lot for an MLS club to splash out. Um... And the only reason he's kind of ended up there is down to work permit issues. So as much as a twist out, you know, we're worried about a twist moving, we're worried about Rossi moving. Um, it's good that they're able, and even Barillo as well, it's good that they're able to, to attract that level of people into the club, you know. So even if these guys move on, you kind of cross your fingers and hope that they will be forward planning and they will bring in subsequent replacements to keep the team at the level that they're at. Yeah, I mean, if Sefuente gets a card, I definitely would be going to be in line to get one. <laughs> so it's all going to be, you know, it just depends on whether or not. I, I don't know how it's going to work out this year. Like, if they only have the MLSPA, are guys who said no last year going to agree this year? I, or, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly. I have no idea how it's going to work. Um, it's a shame, you know, him and Kay don't have cards. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's just, it's just no fun at all. Well. Rodriguez was a sore one. I know he was a wee bit of a we have a pain in the arse sometimes last year, uh, Brian Rodriguez, but he was a good player and it would have been really nice to have that card available for some guys because even when his form is dipping, you might have picked him up cheap and then that might pay off for you at some point, you know? Um, especially yeah, I wonder if, now, how... if you could pick up his card, you're going to be paying much for it. <laughs> That's true. I wonder how many big chances miss he had. And man, it seemed like, it seemed like there were a lot. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. just watching. I mean, yeah, he, he was okay. He had two goals and six assists. You know, his, his, his goals plus assists per per ninety were were not bad. They were half a goal. They were point five, you know, for every ninety minutes he played. So when he was in and playing, he was borderline playable. But it just seemed like he was missing so many shots. And I don't know. See the just, thing that always kind of struck me weird about it is see when Rossi and Rodriguez went away with international duty. I don't know. That's, this is what it was. Uruguay called up Rodriguez, and then he couldn't make it anymore. I think he maybe got COVID or injured. And then they called up Rossi, and it's kind of like, yeah. well, if Uruguay are putting this guy ahead of this guy, why? Well, what do they know that we don't know, or what do they see that we don't see? You know, so I always found that dynamic in terms of the national setup. You know, it seems like Rodriguez is favoured over Rossi. Why? You know, that's an interesting um, dynamic. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to know. Yeah, about. I have no idea who Ur- I don't really know Uruguay's team at all. So I mean, you know, I don't know who they would potentially be playing over, and it must just be they had a better you know, whoever Rossi would play over you know, on the left or at top, you know, it was just, just that player was much better than the, you know, whoever Rodriguez is going to play for is my assumption. Yeah. I, uh, they're also completely different types of players. I mean, size wise, Rossi is yeah. small. I mean, yeah. he's, you've yeah. got to have like the right type of speed and, and passing to utilize his talent, I think, Rodriguez which is why I'm not sure he's going to play well. He'd play well in Europe. It depends what team he goes to. Whereas Rodriguez is, it seems like just from the eye, you know, the eye test, the more kind of, you know, the more stereotypical body type and speed type as far as forward goes. So, yeah. I expect a big year from LA FC. I think all the kind of chat that comes out of that camp is that they want to murder teams this year. So I expect there to be a lot of goals in both directions. The goalkeeper one is going to be one that causes a lot of people a lot of sleepless nights. I'm hoping Cisniga gets more appearances than Vermeer. But I think, see, if you look at both the goalkeepers from last year in terms of what games they played, it's really hard to draw a pattern. Because Vermeer would play for a stretch and then you'd think, all right, Sisniga's playing now towards the end of the season and then you think to yourself, right, that must mean that they value Sisniga because they want to make sure that he's playing in the big games towards the end of the season to be ready for the playoffs. And then the playoffs come around and they played Vermeer. <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's really bizarre. It's really hard to get a handle on. I wouldn't, if you're watching this at home, don't try it. Don't try this at home. Don't try and predict who the goalkeeper for LAFC is going to be because it will cause you no end of problems. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm really, I'm really thankful. As far as, there's the certain things in so rare that cause stress, right? And I'm really, really glad that I'm at the, I, I've been able to build my collection and you know just get lucky. Thirdly, get lucky. I mean, I haven't done anything amazing. From you know, I would say I'm a, probably a, a, a average player, maybe a little bit of an average, but you know, just being early was so lucky, and it allowed me to you know just just get in on the ground floor, really snowball my collection. Um, you know, I haven't put in a huge amount of money. Uh, I've reinvested a lot, but not having to worry about goalkeeper. Like, I just, there's certain teams like, oh, like Napoli. I just, every week, it's the same, it's the same freaking question. And I just, I don't want to worry about that. I don't want to have to, 
I don't want to have to, you know, hope that my goalkeeper is going to be playing or not. Now, in the MLS, you're still going to get that a little bit because there's a couple of teams that, you know, are, have great goalkeepers, but they're still going to sub in. And Toronto was one, like, last year, you had Bono play a couple games instead of Westbrook, and you're like, ah. And, you know, there's a big, potentially a big goal um, keeper battle in some of the other teams as well. And, you know, who's going to win? Titan it was a little bit frustrating last year. He, didn't play some so frustrating uh, this year, it's not even funny <laughs> yeah <laughs> so you know we'll see um but you know hopefully hopefully uh, most of my goalkeepers hopefully most of your goalkeepers are, are the starters my yeah i don't know what's going to happen there i really can't tell i feel like vermeer potentially has the upper hand i know you're a, you're a cisniega but we'll I, see I think I agree with you. When I seen him starting that preseason game, I thought, brilliant, Sisniga starting. So unexpected because, you know, I rate Sisniga because he's came from Sociedad. He's kind of mid-20s. That's a kind of prime age to be picking a goalkeeper up that you're going to invest a lot of time in as a club. But, like I said, they played Vermeer in the playoffs last year after having Sisniga get a run of games in the lead-up to the playoffs. And Sisniga wasn't injured. He wasn't suspended. He wasn't away on a national duty. So I make you right. I think Vermeer has the upper hand on the big games potentially, but I think both of them will probably get fifteen starts this year across all competitions. Yeah, but the problem is you don't know who. Exactly. All right. right, and so fifteen <laughs> start fifteen starts in a thirty six game season is useless if you don't know when they're going to be. Completely. So my advice would be to sell Sisnega now. <laughs> Honestly, well, after he played the preseason game and try to get somebody else who hopefully is one hundred percent. But it's crazy. Have you seen how much the rare MLS rare goalkeepers are going for? I mean, it's, I there's been it. players. I to be honest, recently. There, there's been some 0. 0.8, 0. 0.9ers for, for Willis and Maurer and the top guys. And it's nuts. So, Orlando, um, last season, in MLS is back and in the season itself, I think it actually surprised a lot of people because historically, I followed Orlando quite well since, you know, when Orlando came in as an expansion team, it was the same year as New York and they were kind of like counterparts, you know, there was a kind of unspoken yeah. rivalry there, wasn't there? So, Orlando have always kind of threatened to do well, did really well in the MLS's back and they did really well in the MLS 2020 proper. What do we think that we're going to get from them this season, Martin? I think it's going to be another good season. I mean, the huge difference for them was the firing of Oscar Pereja as manager, um, they that's what they've been missing, a good quality manager. Like before they've kind of had like a good attack, but the defense and the goalkeeper situation was like they pretty much worst in the league situation. But now they kind of shore things up at the back without sacrificing their attacking talent. So I mean, there's not many holes in that squad now, just a couple of depth players really. And maybe you would question um, whether Palo is going to be able to fill the boots of DK, but I mean, that, that's just picking. Now, when I look Pretty at the quick. Orlando team, I, I make you very right, Martin. It's a very strong team. One thing that does jump out at me is that they do have, and I, I think this is a bit of a stereotype with MLS clubs, but I think Orlando kind of perpetuated that. There is a lot of South American talent in this squad. You know, Orlando is in Florida, and for any of you who don't know your American geography too well, it's a very southern state. It's, you know, it's in the, you know, it's on the, what's that part? I was going to say the Caribbean, but that's kind of like the water that it kind of lands into, you know. <laughs> so, um, in terms of geography, it's not too far away from Central and South America. I suspect the kind of climate and the environment yeah. in that kind of state and that country really lends itself to these players coming in and, you know, maybe finding a second home quite easily. I remember when Kaka joined and he loved it in Orlando. Nani's done amazing and like you were saying there, Pato, what will he bring? Yeah, so it's pretty, just um, that the ownership group is Brazilian as well, so it's oh. kind of like it's hand in hand, but they try and bring in the South American talent. Um, and the last, they had a few guys on loan last year that panned out, so they signed them to permanent deals. And yeah, like I say, it's just it's just a pretty strong squad. Um, like, I I think they should be like top four in the East, pretty comfortably. Top four. Yep. Is that with Pato running the show? Yeah, I mean, I think he 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 looks pretty decent. I mean, he's he's only thirty one. He seems to have been around forever. Thirty one is not like really <laughs> old, but um, I know he's had a lot of injuries, but he still had elite talent with like AC Milan. Um. And even if he brings a portion of that, if you can get like ten goals, fifteen goals if you're lucky, then they 
they have goals in other parts of the team. So, I mean, if he does, if he's just like a serviceable job, I think that'll be fine. Um, if he, so it's pretty much a low risk, high reward kind of signing because they didn't really pay much for him. And that's right. He's not even a designated player, so he's not on right. the pay packet. One of the players, you just kind of spoke about it there, Martin, but they did have a lot of loans last year and a few of them have been made permanent. Probably the biggest one in my eyes is Antonio Carlos at centre-back. You know, there was a lot of, when they go back to Brazil, because he did do so well, Palmeiras, I think, were thinking, hmm, maybe we could use this guy again. But he's back in board um, for the 2021 season. He was a very good centre-back. And on SO5 scores, you know, I've just got his so rare data page up. He's got three reds across, you know, basically since his card has been issued. He's a very controlling, very strong centre back, and along with guys like Ruan and Sch- uh, Schlegel, they've got a really like stereotypical, tough, hard nosed defence, don't they? Yeah, and the p- centre back pair of Jansen and <coughs> Antonio Carlos should be pretty much locking down like the majority of MLS attack, um, and then they have the two attacking wing backs with Tinio and Ryan. Um, the question, I, I, I guess the biggest question would be the left. Virginio has been injured in the, all three seasons he's been in MLS and he had an outside injury last year. So if anything, I'd say the left back situation would be the one spot that you're worried about in the team. But besides that, um, there's not really too many balls so. Yeah, that's kind of my thinking. On, on the, uh, well, I watched um, Orlando and... Oh, who was it? Was it New England? What, what was the game with the crazy penalty shootout? I watched that whole game just by coincidence live, and I actually thought Ruhan was a wee bit. I know he gets sent off in that match, but he seems like uh, a bomb scare. You know, he seems like he's a red card waiting to happen. You know, he's just so fine. Yeah, he's a little bit. Yeah, he's kind of like he's a little bit up and down. I mean, he has like elite pace, so he can really like push down the wing and. You can get the good attacking situation, but then defensively, you can be a little bit neglectful. So. But um, just on something you just said there a second ago, Jansen, the other centre-back, I've just put his Surreal data page on screen. Now, he's not really got the, the highs that Antonio Carlos has got, right? He's got a few more reds. He's got a few less DNPs. But his price at the moment is still, like, on the secondary market, the cheapest available is 0.085, which... For where we're at at the moment in the grand scheme of things, for a solid, right. a guy that will play 30 matches a season, most likely, depending on injury and suspension, um, that's potentially a really good pickup for a, a starter card. No, no, no two ways about it. When I look at Orlando's midfield, but Martin, I, I must admit, there's a lot of kind of the, the the main the main name that jumps out at me when I look at the midfield, right, is Mauricio Perea. Now, Mauricio Perea had a good year last year, right, and it wasn't actually until recently I was listening to something. And it's actually his underlying stats in terms of like entries into the final third, key passes, that kind of thing. They're amongst the best in the division. And I mean the entire division. You know, he's, he was a very prolific midfielder whilst going under the radar. Um, I'm looking at his price at the moment. It's quite decent. 0.2 is the 0.214 is the cheapest one available at time of recording. And when you look at his SO5 scores, I think all those DNPs, his last five, his last 15, right. is what's kept him away from the wider SoRare community in terms of the marketplace. But when you look at the full SoRare data page and you see his actual SO5 scores last year, they're very attractive, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, he's the, like, he came from a pretty high-level Russian league for Christmas or he struggled a little bit at first to settle in because I think he's just been playing continuously. But, like, the, towards the second half of last season, you could see the elite kind of skill set he brings. And I think if you... There's a statistic that he creates more shots per 90 minutes than any other player in MLS. There you go. More than like Ladero. So, like, that's pretty much ideal kind of statistic for the SF5 score. And he, I mean, for his price, he's probably one of the best bang for the buck players in so rare, I would say. Because he, he's pretty much the fulcrum of every, all the attacking for them. So, he's pretty much at the center of everything. I totally agree with that. See, one thing I do like about Orlando, and I kind of touched on this already, right? But see, when I seen Kaka come in and when I seen Nani come in, both of those guys have been great MLS DPs because they did come in, both of them, and they really take it seriously. They're not here for an easy pay packet. You know, they're here to win, to be on the pitch, to make a name for themselves, to leave a legacy behind at that club in the MLS. Um, so I'm hoping when I see the Pato transfer come in, that that's the environment he comes into. But it's like, listen, pal, you're not here to fuck about <laughs> you know you're here to play you're here to play football you're here to score goals and you better train hard and you better work hard you know 
Um, is that the it, it, you know in, along with uh, Vanderwater who's come in as well? I can really see Orlando being a really high you know high energy attacking force this year. But would you go along with that as well, Martin? Is like is an insight? Yeah, I think like that. I think that like you make that Vanderwater sign in is pretty important because um, he's young. He's he's got a pretty good pedigree in Dutch football and kind of takes the pressure off Nani having to play every game. Like you can kind of see, kind of faded a little bit down the stretch in um, the last couple of seasons. So, I mean, if, if they can kind of space out his playing a bit more and integrate Van der Water into the team, I don't think that there's too much of a drop off there now at that, on the wing position. And it should help Nani towards the end of the season to be a lot more fit and producing at a high level. I totally agree. When you look at Van der Water's stats in the Eredivisie, which by all accounts, you know, it's a, a better league than MLS, certainly. But MLS does have a lot of different challenges to it in terms of travel, in terms of pitch conditions, climates that you operate in, etc. So it doesn't always directly translate, as you and I both know. Coming from Europe into MLS isn't a guarantee of success, but right. it, it, it does increase the chances, of course, you know, if it's a, a good pedigree player. And his scores last you know, this the season we're currently in with Heracles have been very attractive and you would hope along guys alongside guys like Perea, Benji Michelle, Chris Muller, Nani, Pato, you would hope that this guy comes into a really operational system and can be really good in SO five. His current price now is around a quarter of a coin. So when you compare that to Perea, who's already in the league, who already has really promising stats, Perea's cheaper than this guy. He's not under twenty three of course. Um but it, it kinda goes back to the point you were making there that bang for buck you know, Perea is definitely going to be up there in terms of one of the best in the division. Let me ask you, but Benji, Michelle, Chris Muller, how good will they be this year? Oh, Muller's already like elite level. Um, he's been called up to the national team. Squad. Um, he's just like, it's whether he can go on to the kind of next level of being like an elite player now. Um, he, like, if you look at like the important goals that he come up with, um, it's He's just been like exceeded all expectations. Michelle is more of like a super sub kind of role, I would say. He has just he has good pace. So like last season, he would come on when they were trying to like play up the game, and it, they would break away, and he'd like bang in a goal. So he's more of like I wouldn't be like unless they get injuries, I would say he would have a, like a huge role on the team. But with like double game week he could be like a rotational player to come in so I mean like as a squad kind of player I mean very serviceable yeah well, I'm just looking at his SO5 so scores so now uh, Benji Michelle and it's either red or green um, <laughs> I think that kind of lends itself to what you're saying he's coming off the bench as an impact sub if he comes off the bench and he, contrib he contributes to the outcome of the match he's going to hit a green and if he doesn't he's hitting a red and when you're starting out and you're going for D4 global thresholds a player like that can be very useful for the kind of price you can pick them up for yeah, I mean, Muller's price is probably, I don't really look, but it's probably at least, probably about 25 maybe, I would guess. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he's more like, uh, he's someone you could probably rely on as like a every game starter. I mean, he's pretty consistent. He, I mean, he's contributing even if he isn't um, scoring or assisting. I mean, he's, he has good pace and he's good awareness. So he's always getting in good positions in the box. So, um, I I mean, I'd be excited to have him on my team. So I would be too. Chris Miller's one of the ones that I wish I picked up when he was, they were going much cheaper before the booms and stuff we've had. As well as Nanny. I've not picked up a Nanny, but I, I, again, kind of back to what I was saying a moment ago, the what you see from him, you know, he does take it seriously. He takes his own reputation seriously, you know. Um, and players like that I can always get behind. So I've actually got a good bit of faith for Orlando. You make them top three, top four. I could go along with that quite easily um, because of the talent they've got, the coach they've got and the, the kind of crest of the wave that they're on from MLS, uh, MLS's back and you know the cup run they had last year, certainly. I mean, I think really only the, the only two teams I'd say that were clearly better. They were like tied kind of third in Philadelphia in my kind of rankings in the East behind Columbus and New England. I, I would probably go along with that. In terms of the East, I'm quite, you know, I'm biased, but I'm quite uh, hopeful the NYC and Atlanta can, can can come back again. Um, 
You've also, of course, got uh, guys like Toronto knocking around as well. So it's a really competitive conference. I think the East is much more competitive than the West in that respect that there's a lot of clubs that are like six, seven out of tens. There's a lot of them. Whereas in the West, you've maybe got a few more guys that are maybe nine out of ten like clubs in terms of how well built they are and that kind of thing. But no, with the right run of form, the right run of fixtures, I, I definitely make you right. Looking at the fixtures for Orlando, um, in terms of how they open the season and whatever, I'm just going to have a wee peek at that and see what we think. Huge opening day game against the rivals at Atlanta. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, day one, yeah, big derby against Atlanta. There's a lot of history there. You then get Kansas away, who won the Western Conference last year. Then you're at home back-to-back -back with Cincinnati and New York, away to D.C., um, and then we're away to Toronto. Uh, pardon me, yeah, home at Toronto, away to the Bulls, and then away to Toronto. So that first opening kind of salvo from mid-April to mid-June, first like eight matches or so, I don't think there's any easy matches there. <laughs> to be honest with no. you. But that doesn't... I mean, not... I, I, it's go. kind of like, it's kind of like, like in between kind of starting, I would say. I mean, um, I, I mean, the, the first game will kind of set the tone because that'll be like a big emotional game. If they can get the three points there, then I'd be pretty happy. If they lose that, that might kind of send them into like a negative headspace again because there's that like the rivalry and with, with everything with Joseph Martinez. Yeah. So <laughs> very well documented. So, that, it? Yeah, so they kind of want to get that out of the way, and if they can get the win there, I think they'll be okay. So Andrew, we're coming on to FC Cincy or Cincinnati to most of the folks at home. Now, I've been actually kind of, I think I've kind of fell in love with them over the summer. I've just got this thing in my head that I want them to do well. And, you know, the down the Superverse that I've got tight on and the Matarita that I won before Christmas. Um, but, you know, I've been kind of following them throughout the preseason. Things have went quite well. Um, they've been really terrible for the last couple of seasons. So they've got a new stadium. The fans are really hopeful this is going to be a big, big season for them. They've been out and got uh, guys like Brenner and Acosta coming into the lineup. As well as some other guys that we'll be more familiar with. Like, I was really happy when I won my uh, Matarita because he's an NYC player and he quickly transferred to he's Cincinnati. Um, so I'm looking forward to him doing well with Cincinnati. I hope that, you know, they, I, I hope they do well. You know, they, it's kind of hard for them not to do better than what they've been doing in the last yes. couple of seasons, you know. Um, but with guys like that who are creative, who can link up, along with the big man Brenner that they've picked up up front then I'm quite hopeful. Um, but like I say, I was a wee bit gutted when he did transfer initially because I'm, like, I'm a big NYC fan That's and, fun. you know, getting a, a, an NYC super rare, I was absolutely buzzing when I won it and then not too dissimilar to you, a couple of days after I got it, he bloody went and transferred to Cincy, didn't he? So here we go. It's, it's when you say that. So I, uh, Matarita was either the second or third card I bought on so rare. Uh, I'm also a New York City FC fan and I bought his card and he got... Uh, he moved to Cincinnati the very next day. Oh, that is a kick in the stones. <laughs> oh, Jesus, unlucky, mate. Mm -hmm. I was so excited for it, and uh, off he goes. But hopefully uh, he'll just dominate in Cincinnati and make me forget about that, uh, the disappointment, and they'll just see more green dots going his way. Well, as long as they know who they've bought when they've bought the guy, because he's not going to be doing any defending, yeah. you know. But if they know, you know, it's Matarita and he's going to be attacking and bombing on, then I'm quite confident he will do well this year, um, as long as, it's, <laughs> you know, they know who they've bought because he won't be doing any defending, you know. So we know that since they need to improve at the back, but they've actually spent the majority of their money in forward attacking players, you know, Luciano Acosta and Brenner, like I've mentioned a couple of times already. And this seems to be the area that they're really trying to push on. Jurgen Lacadia didn't really come off last year, didn't really score the goals. Kubo was kind of floating around, didn't do too much. Frankie Amaya was the star of the show in midfield. And since we've recorded this, um, you guys at home will know Frankie Amaya's now left. But that aside, if you guys are Harris Medellin, um, Andrew, when, where do you look in this Cincy midfield for inspiration? Uh, I have, I unfortunately look at uh, Luciano Acosta first, um, and it's part of it is it's not really spite, it's it's disappointment. So uh, Luciano Acosta's card from last season is from Atlas because he he went to Liga MX. So Luciano Acosta used to play for DC United, and there was a transfer window, and on the last day he was either at the airport or he was actually on a plane to Paris because he was going to get a move to PSG, which looking back is absolutely outrageous to consider because he's nowhere near the level that uh, they should have been. Um, so he ended up not getting the move. Uh, he had a few very good games with Wayne Rooney in DC. 
Um, and then he made this move to Atlas. So when the when Atlas was introduced uh, to to so rare, uh, he was back, you know, he had a card and I bought one early and he just wasn't playing at Atlas. Like he was this creative midfielder who I had seen in MLS and was very good. I kept saying to myself, if this guy was good enough to go to PSG, surely he should be able to play in Liga MX. And he just wasn't playing. And so I sold his card and uh, for nothing. I mean, it was slightly more than I paid. I paid nothing for it. I sold it for nothing plus, you know, a little bit. And uh, like a month later, he gets this move to, to Cincinnati. And this team, I think the midfield is going to be his. Like if they're going to work around kind of the, the creativity that he has. And so I think um, he's definitely the guy in that midfield that um, they're going to use to, you know, there will be Matarit on the wing and Acosta in the middle trying to get the ball to Brenner. And I think if you try to get any value out of anyone other than those three, assuming uh, Amaya leaves, which is kind of the talk right now, um, I, I don't know how you look at anyone else on the roster and say that that's who I want, uh, because I think those three are just far, far uh, above everybody else. I completely agree, Andrew. And it will be really interesting to see, you know, how these guys develop throughout the season. They've always got um, Harris Medayun as well. Medunan? Medayun? Yeah. <laughs> I used to be able to pronounce it A-OK, and then I heard someone else, like a commentator or something, say his name differently the way I say it, and it's just totally threw me off ever since. Um, but yeah, yeah him. I know exactly what you mean. Uh, yeah, so him. So, you know, he, he's quite cheap, you know, he's quite reliable in terms of MLS and... Yes. He could be somebody that, you know, on the cheaper end of the scale, we may get 10 games, maybe five substitute appearances, 10 substitute appearances. And he's somebody at the budget end who could contribute to this team in, in, in a positive way, certainly. But all these guys, they could do well in midfield. They could be making chances through passes, crosses, Matarita's flying away down the full, uh, down down the line. But they need guys to stick the ball in the net. You yeah. know, they've went big. They've went and bought Brenner. You know, it's probably the most high profile transfer of the off season so far and I read comments recently about Brenner talking about Brazilians are now talking about yeah. MLS more in terms of like media coverage and that sort of thing after his transfer so that may be something that develops as time goes on but it's a little bit like Lucadio last year it's a big name coming in he needs to hit the ground running he needs to score the goals for them I do back him to do it from the very little I do know of him he is a striker I will probably try and buy when the card comes out, if it comes out, but I do know full heartedly, a uh, young Brazilian striker <laughs> is not going to be cheap and um, you're going to have to pony up big time if you want to get him in. Um, outside of Brenner, of there's guys like Kubo and like I mentioned already, Lacadia. Um, you know, they've got all the ingredients there. As long as Stam can make it work, you know, he can actually get all the training ground stuff translated to on pitch performances. I see, I'm quite confident since he will be in amongst a lot of the conversations this year. Yeah, I think you have to hope that he starts the season very poorly uh, when you don't have his card and then jump on. With, that's when you get it. Yeah. When everybody says, oh, I made a big mistake, I'm just take him for whatever you can give me and the, then we can take advantage. Completely. You know, if you if you believe in something, you want to pick up their card. Bad form is an opportunity for entry, you know. Um, another guy that I've got in my, my roster that I've had for a good while, I spent far too much ETH on him and I've been regretting it ever since. Uh, Fiat-wise, it's a decent rate. Uh, but that's Alan Cruz, one of the hot boys, one of the boys from uh, Costa Rica. So he's an attacking winger. Didn't really play too much last year, really struggled with injury and whatever. But if he's fit, he's a really exciting he's a really exciting player for me. It does go very cheap on the market. So if you are looking for a budget taking a punt, then this guy could feature a lot, and if he is supplying those balls to Brenner, to Lucho, you know, Lucho Acosta, these types of guys, then he could be a really good uh, winger come attacking midfielder this year. <laughs> I'd say the only other one worth talking about is Jurgen uh, Lacadia, who um, has been an absolute disaster there, um, at least with the expectations. I think, was he with Brighton before he came over? Yeah, that was his last club. Um, he basically, you were talking earlier about um, hardworking Europeans who come over and if they take uh, MLS seriously, then they can really pay off. And something just didn't work with Lacadia. And I think part of it might be that the team wasn't that great around him, but uh, he's actually on loan and that loan expires at the end of June. And they're, he hasn't given them any reason to, you know, extend that loan at all. So uh, if you kind of see this, oh, he's 27 and he's a European, he's, he could be up front for Cincinnati. Like it's, it's possible he's gone um, at the end of June after not starting any matches because Brenner starts them all. So just something to watch out for uh, if you're kind of just sorting and don't really know the teams that well. Just uh, buyer beware on, on Lacadia. 
So the next team we're going to have a look at is the Vancouver Whitecaps. Okay, now for some reason on flash scores, they do not have Kripal or Ta Thomas Hassel. Unless it's a goalkeeper, which is a bizarre error, but there you go. Um, again, similar to um, the last team me and you were chatting about when we were recording, Jeremy, um, San Jose. When you kind of look over the squad, there's nothing that really jumps out to you as overly exciting or, you know, oh wow, I can't wait to see how this guy does next year. Baldissimo Cavallini had little spells last year where they looked, you know, capable, certainly they looked decent. Freddy Montero, I know he's a massive loss to the Whitecaps. <laughs> that just shows you how, how thin the squad is for them, yeah. you know. <laughs> that guy of 34 or whatever age he is with one knee, him leaving yeah. is a bit of a talking point. But there's not, again, some, there's not too much meat on the bones. The goalkeeper situation for so rare is probably the most exciting one with Kripal coming back from injury. Some guys that have been on the platform for a while have been holding on to him forever, waiting for him to come back from this bloody broken finger. And last year, we had a wee bit of Thomas Hassel action. You're an under-23 goalkeeper. doesn't look like you'll be number one this year. But I would still expect Thomas Hassel to maybe get five to ten games, maybe, throughout the year. Would you go along with that? Uh, I, I don't know. Like, uh, I, I know that Kripo, they'll, they'll definitely want him back in the squad because that'll give them some consistency. Uh, honestly, I think Hassel, I think, was just a bit of a flash in the pan, like, I, I mean, he's a Canadian, so I'm hoping for the best with yeah, yeah. him. Um, but he's he's really young. Like I I don't know um, how many games he'll actually get in. But that being said, there's yeah. always some nervousness whenever you have a, a goalie with like a finger injury, and you're like, and you're already I already wrote this out like weak team, like <laughs> like that's already uh, there's many red flags. That I would say like I like Mark Dos Santos as their coach. I think he's definitely more forward moving, but as you mentioned, like Vancouver, just as a Canadian fan, is definitely the weakest of like the three. Um, Cavallini, I wrote here, starved of service. Like he just scored three goals versus the Cayman Islands for Canada. It helps when you have uh, Alfonso Davies, you know, yeah. firing balls into you, and you're getting like support from and actually, well, it actually helps you play in the Cayman Islands. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> That's what I was going to say. <laughs> Actually, I should say that is that prior to this, I was actually watching the, the game against uh, it Bermuda, another like um, really mm -hmm. weak Concacaf team, and Cavallini missed at least four or five golden chances, and then the rest of the team just did all the work for him. So he's definitely one of those like hit or miss players. He definitely has the most. I'd say the most potential on that team is Cavallini, and then Crepo. You're just you're hoping he makes like 25 saves in some of these games because they're just going to get like bombarded <laughs> with shots and hopefully he doesn't like injure his finger even more after facing yeah. all those. Um, I put Ali Ad Adnan. I'm a very polite person, yep. but I put Ali Adnan sucks because he's like <laughs> the, worst, the worst DP I've ever seen. Like going back to like, it used to be in the MLS that like you'd have these boomer bust DPs. Like I wrote it down like Beckham, good decision. Defoe, bad decision. Yep. Uh, Rooney, good decision. Gerard and Lampard, poor decision. Like, uh, Bradley Wright Phillips, good decision. So it seems like every time they have, uh, you know, it's kind of one hit, one miss. Uh, Ali Adnan is so far a complete miss for Vancouver. Cavallini is their other designated player. I really like him. I th I'm also extremely biased because I'm hoping that, you know, he leads us into the World Cup in 2022, which is an off chance or even, um, you know, possibly the big thing is in 2026 when the World Cup comes to North America, like having like Joe David plus Alfonso Davies plus Cavallini, like that team could be absolutely stacked um, with young potential talent. Uh, considering Canada, other than that, has had one previous World Cup like appearance. <laughs> so... Um, Cavallini needs service. Is he going to get it? I'm going to guess no. So, Fair enough. Yeah. Um, just, just pulling it, I've, I've pulled up Ali Adnan's uh, SO5 graph. It's actually quite attractive. Um, I so maybe I'm uh, wrong on that one. I don't know. But, I just can't stand his play, but I, again, I'm also a Toronto FC fan, so maybe that's it. Yeah, well, it's one of these things. It's kind of like what you said with Kripal. You know, if they're under a lot of defensive pressure, it, you know, Sometimes that's kind of good for SO5, you know, if they're involved in a lot of actions, you know, if he's having to win headers, if he's having to make clearances, you know, that kind of thing. Um, 
as much as, as I'd agree with you in terms of a DP, he's far from being inspired. Um, but, <laughs> you know, 27 year old centre back's not got much of an international kind of presence or whatever. Because the DPs, what they should what they should be in my mind anyway, partially, is like a beacon to say this is what you get when you come to our club. You know, you're going to be playing with an attacking number 10, a great striker, and a solid goalkeeper, whatever. Um, and, you know, the, the DPs, for the bigger teams anyway, they've always been quite character you know you were talking about Ger like Gerard get and Galaxy goes hand in hand because it's so commercial you know and then you get guys maybe like I don't know David Villa at New York that goes well because it's like a philosophy type thing you know Martinez and Almiron South America you know Wonderland in Atlanta you know <laughs> Jovinko you know going to uh, Toronto you know sometimes you know a, a lot of DPs for me I, I think they should always be quite reflective of the club itself you know and when it is like a kind of just a veteran kind of hard nosed centre back, it's not overly inspiring for a DP choice. But he's hovering about point one two ish to now, and he's gotten a hundred in his locker. I suspect it was a goal and a clean sheet in that match, but it could be a wee budget defender certainly. Um, yeah, but, I was like, I know that, like, I know Vancouver was kicking the tires at Porto and at Benfica trying to get like a reasonable designated player there yeah because again i would say that ali Adnan is not your prototypical like dp but i should i should say this as much as like yeah i'm a bit emotional there with the sucks parts to it um that's where maybe the eye test isn't always true to like the statistics right because yeah, so five yeah maybe when it just comes down to like touches clearances you know like really boring stats maybe he is kind of getting those and if you're getting them at a cheap price you know it's probably maybe worth a worth a go, right? Because not, uh, not too much. Most downside. teams you're gonna get as like forwards or yeah. A, a big part of I think when you're buying cards for SO five is kind of knowing what you're getting. You know, you wouldn't pick up a card in a team like the, the couple of teams we spoke about so far. Anyway, you're not gonna pick a guy up like that and expect him to be. You know, you're, you're not buying him and expecting him to become Mbappe or Neymar or something like. You're kind of buying him knowing this is a centre back for Vancouver. This is a midfielder for. The, the quakes you know you kind of need to know and just appreciate what it is you're buying and understand that's that's the kind of the, the lay of the land if you like you know um but yeah that, nothing else really jumps out to me um for vancouver in terms of the roster likely this season i don't know if they finished in playoffs i don't think we've really got a clear guidance on how many playoff positions are going to be this year i think that's still kind of yet to be determined um but i, I don't i know they finished last season strong but i'm not holding my breath on them doing well this year um, I say they finished last season strong. They did lose three of their last five, but I know they made a, a late push. They almost squeezed into the playoffs at the end. They just missed out, but I don't expect them to do much better this year overall. Um, yeah. Anything you'd like to add on the Whitecaps? No, I think that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. just a kind of a middling team that might be like worth a flyer here and there, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't stock up on yeah. Whitecap players. Yeah. Now, obviously, we were chatting earlier on, Martin, about Atlanta and Orlando that kind of rivalry but Miami is actually the same state as Orlando you know do we you know what what's the vibe over there with Miami from an Orlando perspective do you see them as a rival do you see them as like a derby match is that taken to the same kind of level I mean there's more hatred build up with Atlanta right now um the Miami one will be kind of organic so I think it'll kind of grow as the seasons go along so I mean I guess they, they see more of us a more of us as a rival than we see them as a rival right now. <laughs> They're kind of like the noisy little neighbor down south, and we're kind of like, we kind of see we're like the established team that they're trying to catch up to. Oh, fair enough. Now, um, when I look at Miami, and a lot of a lot of UK users especially, when you look at Miami and you see like Phil Neville's come in, they've brought in Shawcross, um, there have been a few names from last season that we recognize anyway, the Higuain brothers. Don't think, um, don't think uh, Federico Higuain is returning right enough. Guys like Breck Shea, who's played in the Premier League in the past, and I think there might have been somebody else. Maybe that's it. Um, but they do have that little contingent. Blaise Matuidi, who, you know, I mentioned the Higuains. There is a few more familiar names in that Miami squad to maybe the novice MLS fan. Now, expecting Phil Neville to come in and hit the ground running, I think, is naive. Expecting him to be as kind of let's say clueless is De Boer. I don't think that will happen because De Boer just seems rubbish. He's not done anything anywhere. Phil Neville doesn't have much of a background minus the women's game. I accept that. But 
I think uh, I think Neville will be much more studious in terms of a coach. I think he'll be much more considered in terms of the tactical approach he takes, how he tries to integrate new parts of the team, and how they try to move on tactically. They do have some really big DPs in Blaise Matuidi, Pizarro, and um, Gonzalo Higuain. And normally, when you have a team that have you know those caliber of DPs floating around, they are normally right in the conversation for winning silverware. But that doesn't really seem to feel like the case for Miami. Why would you say that is? I guess for me, like if you see like the way like Nashville kind of came into the league, they kind of tried to build up a strong defensive base, um, try and keep things tight, and then like build more attacking ways as the season went on. Whereas I think Miami went the other way and they tried to focus more on the attack and they had Robles in goal who was kind of past it. Yep. defensively they were kind of all over the place so I kind of think they went the wrong way about trying to build a team they kind of just like neglected like the defensive side of the game totally and tried to throw a, a few big DPs in there and hope that that would work but it didn't really I mean you see signs of it in some games but it just didn't really integrate as a team at all no totally and the, the little pieces I did see from Matuidi and Tigwain, again, similar to our guys we were chatting about earlier in the, um, in, in the video, but they seem to take it really seriously. You know, they're taking their own reputation seriously. They're taking the burden of being in the first squad for this club quite seriously. You know, I see Matuidi covering all blades of the grass, making goal line clearances, getting into the box for assists, that kind of thing. And Higuain, even though he wasn't always, he, he scored one, maybe two goals, but he was always involved in passing and moving. He didn't really throw the towel in in any matches. You know, he was... Obviously, transferring from Italy and COVID, there was also a weird circumstance around a lot of that. Um, but again, I, I think those DPs do stand in good stead. There's some there's some MLS guys in here that, again, the novice might not be familiar with. Leandro Perez Gonzalez, or if you're listening to any MLS kind of media, they refer to him as LGP, is a MLS Cup winner. He's a big, big player. Didn't really hit the ground running last season, but having that kind of... Um, experience alongside a guy like Shawcross who they've also brought in both those guys are not terribly mobile but they're both very commanding centre backs so you would hope kind of like you're saying there they maybe adopt a wee bit more of that Nashville approach where they're like right let's be solid at the back let's not give away cheap goals and then we can build from there defensively LGP and Shawcross aside because they're both ancient um, so, oh LGP is not really that old I suppose is there anyone else defensively in that Miami team who would appeal to you from an SO5 situation I think like Leodam, he he was pretty nice with Seattle when he played for them, um, and he could like his price was like really cheap. I mean, his card was showing as still not playable in that pretty soon, but you could get him for like under point one for sure. Yeah. Um, and I think he's pretty solid. Um, I don't think Brett Shea had a card, so. That's not either. really going to help you. No. And then, obviously, they're bringing in Gibbs in the summer as well. They already signed him mm -hmm. to take over their left back spot. I forgot all about Kean Gibbs, of course. So, yeah, so we've oh. got a wee bit more of an attacking fullback coming into the league as well. Premier League calibre, of course. The midfield kind of picks itself. You know, we've got Matuidi, we've got Gregor, the new signing, who I think a few more MLS clubs were also trying to sign and maybe didn't. Uh, he's now 27. And then they've got Rodolfo Pizarro and they've got um, my boy Lewis Morgan as well. So their midfield actually seems quite well-rounded. There's not a lot of depth there, but if all the first-team guys can play, I think they've got a really combative and really competitive midfield, certainly. Um, the Gregor guy, do, we, do you know much about him yourself? I've only read bits and pieces of his stats and whatever, but I've not seen him play. I, I haven't seen too much about him. I just He's got a pretty good pedigree, though, so... I mean, that should really help stiffen up the defensive side of the midfield, at least, and give a platform for Morgan and Bizarro, Pellegrini to produce the attacking side to set up Higain, hopefully, because he kind of struggled, Higain, when he came in last season. I mean, obviously, he came into quite a struggling team, um, but, I mean, it's a pretty big season for him. Obviously, he has a huge pedigree from Italy, and so you would think... He should be able to have a pretty nice season this year. And obviously, Morgan's like an elite kind of MS, MLS level talent. Um, he's just like probably one of the best creators in MLS. So he's like, I mean, he's a really nice card to have. And his price is still pretty 
reasonable for his age and what he can do. So, I mean, I cause he's Scottish, so people kind of go crazy about <laughs> that. There you go. I think it's because he's Scottish. A lot of people. I mean, he's quite. He, I think he will. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm like attacking wise. They they should be pretty decent, but again, it's just going to be like trying to shore up the defense. And big question about McCarthy and goal for me. Obviously, they're, they're rumored to be signing Marsman from Feyenoord yep. in the summer. He's meant to be coming on. So. Um, Obviously, I wouldn't necessarily want to be buying McCarthy um, as a card, but I mean, yeah, that's 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 again my question mark on this team defensively still. Um, like seeing what Neville Neville as a manager, I, I'm not like, fully convinced. So, I mean, like you say, he can't he should be better than De Boer, but I don't know how his kind of coaching style will it be in MLX. So I mean I'm interested to see how it pans out. I mean this is quite a like it's potentially exciting team to watch. Um because it, it there's such a like a range of things that could happen for me with this team. They could just like totally blow up and be like total rubbish or they could be like an elite level attacking team. So I mean there's such a range of things that most teams I could say are like this is probably gonna happen but this team like, I could I mean I have no idea what it's gonna end up like <laughs> Um, and probably the last thing we'll touch on on that kind of note is they did have a few exciting guys they brought in last year who didn't hit the ground running. You just named one of them there, Pellegrini, and also Julian Carranza. So they do have some guys, that, and Robbie Robinson as well from the draft. There's some attacking young talent in there that didn't hit the ground running last year, but they have had a pre-season now. They have all integrated. The club itself has got its act together a bit better. Um, and you never know, there could be a few surprises coming into that because, I mean, you're expecting... In the games they do well, they will be front foot attacking. I think that's a safe expectation. But what we're both worried about is how many goals are they going to concede and how many games will they concede that amount of goals in. Um, so time will tell on that front. But there's a lot of little gems in there that, you know, Carranza's 20, Pellegrini's 21, Robbie Robinson's 22. So there's three guys under, you know, U23 eligible for SO5. That, you know, I've not checked all their prices, but I know in the grand scheme of things, they will be modest at this point in time who could be a breakout surprise kind of card. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, for sure. Like, there, there's going to be a lot of rotation in these teams from because there's going to be a lot of midweek games. And so these young players will get their chance just whether they can take it. Because um, there's also, there's lots of, people forget that with MLS, there's the games that still have in when the international breaks are on. So exactly. there's a lot of, like potential for some of these players who don't start the season to come in and get some good playing time. Now, I'm just looking at Miami's fixtures, okay? Now, the first, like, what am I looking at? Wow. The first four fixtures, I don't see them getting any points. They're at home. They, well, they're at home at Galaxy, right? Now, that, that, that could be a win for Miami because Galaxy are by no stretch of the imagination to finish the article either. But I do fancy Galaxy, and I think they're a wee bit more cohesive than what Miami could be. That'd be a really interesting game to watch, right enough. But then they're away back to back to Philly and Nashville. I can't see them getting much there. And then they're at home to Atlanta. And then the first game I'd give them a bit of a chance in is they're at home in Montreal on the 12th of May. Um, but again, similar to other teams we're talking about, that initial stretch, especially for Phil Neville, Higuain, that whole Miami project, they need to pick up six to nine points quite quickly, I think, to get them a bit of confidence, to get them on a bit of a run. And in that opening like five matches, I think if they were to pick up four to six points i think they were probably quite chuffed for that and then after that little stretch you're then looking at cincinnati and chicago both away back to back those games will be difficult then they've got dc twice home and away back to back and then it's orlando and the derby at the end of june so that opening period there is definitely there's no there's no games miami can really if anything all these teams are looking at miami as a team they should be getting three points off of so they're going into a lot of these games as underdogs how do they step up to that and how do they perform, I think, is the real questions. Come that kind of time, by the time you're meeting them, mid-June, would you expect them to be a cohesive team, do you think? Do you think that will be? I mean, I think we'll kind of get an idea of how they're going to be. I, I mean, I expect them to um, be better than last year, a bit more solid defensively. Um, so, like, there's another team that I expect to be kind of like on the edge of the playoff line. Um 
whether they're just inside or whether they're just outside, just kind of depend on like injuries and just how quickly they do integrate. It's just at the beginning of the season, I think it's just important because there's so many playoff places, just teams don't want to get like zero points. As long as they can kind of hang around, there's always the opportunity later in the season just to put a run together, to sneak in the playoffs. And then like if you're playing well when it gets to the playoffs, then you've got a good chance. Then. No, totally. And I think that was quite similar to like Minnesota or Nashville. One of them really had a big run towards the end of the season and they just crept in. Miami actually done that last year also. They actually made a wee bit of a run towards the end and they didn't really get into the playoff playoffs, but they got into the kind of pretend playoffs that we had last year, you know. Um, so, yeah, no, definitely. Actually, so, thanks a lot, Richard, for joining us. I've had a lot of fun. We've went through the Fire, we went through Rapids, DC United, Portland, Kansas City, some really tasty clubs there. Hopefully you guys at home picked something up, maybe a player you might want to go and scout or a club you might want to deep, uh, dive a little bit deeper into. I've had a lot of fun and I hope you stick around for the rest of the series. I've got some amazing guests coming. Richard has set a very high bar for the rest of the guests that are yet to come on and record in terms of all the kind of insight he was able to offer us and a little bit of tidbits of info. So thank you very much, Richard, for joining us. It means a lot to me. No, thank you, Johnny. Like, I, I learned, I think I may have learned more than you did. Jeez, like, <laughs> your knowledge is absolutely incredible. I don't um, believe I've that. enjoyed this a lot. <laughs> Just pulling up random stats from the Croatian League. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what you get here. That's, that's, that's amazing. I uh, absolutely love it. And so thanks a lot for having me. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Severe USA. Um, otherwise, like, follow this guy. This, this was fun. Thank you so much. Magic. And um, I, I'm sure we'll do more content throughout the MLS season anyway. We, I'm sure this will become a regular thing. We'll get together and compare notes and and speculate and all the rest of it throughout okay. the year. Talk about how much we enjoy the Rapids. That's it. That's it. So if you want to see more, guys, smash the like button, subscribe, share, retweet, all that good stuff. Stay out of trouble and we'll catch you on the next one.